establish a contact with this region, and establish a contact to the dielectric, to, to the conductive material right here. I'm gonna name them, I'm gonna name this guy source, this one drain, and this one. Whatever you have in the bottom, right, the rest of the silicon, we call it the bottom. So you, know, you may have another contact here that connects to the bottom of the device. Okay? So you have, for each master, you actually have four contacts. You usually see three, but you have four contacts, and we'll see one. Okay, so forget about the body terminal for now, right? So, so on top, if you look at it, I have made the contact to here. Made a contact to here and a contact to here, and the body terminal is somewhere over here. But let's not worry about the body terminal for now until we come back and see what it does to the operation of the uh, First question forget about the two doped regions. If you look at, so forget about this. If you look at the structure you have between the gates, and a piece of silicon at the bottom. What do you have? Is it a capacitor? Who said that? It's a capacitor, right? You have a conductor at the bottom, a semiconductor, but you know, more or less a conductor, a dielectric and another conductor. That's a capacitor, right? So that, at the heart of it, you have a capacitor. And then we have put these two group regions next to that and involved. We'll see what happens. Okay. Good. So we have a capacitor, and what is the current going into the gate if I apply a voltage there? So if you connect, let me move this down a bit. Yeah, actually, just for one moment. So now the naming is obvious. You know, metal oxide semiconductor refers to this structure. Metal oxide semiconductor. Nowadays, you don't use the metal for the gate material, and you don't use oxide for the dielectric. It's different stuff. But the name is stuff. So it's a metal oxide semiconductor structure. And now, what happens, let's say, if you put uh, for now, let's assume my body is ground. Let's just not worry about the body terminal for now. So what happens if I apply a voltage to the gate of this device? What do you think will happen? How much is the current going through the gate or into the gate? A DC voltage. Zero. It's a capacitor, right? What about source or drain terminals? Sorry, are the drain and source connected to the conductor or? They are here. Well, they have their own contact, their own contacts. So they are not connected to this. Oh. It's a separate wire. Okay. A separate wire. So what, what happens when the drain? Okay. So what happens? So with gate, nothing happens. What if I connect, let's say, a voltage source between these two? is called BDS, right? What happens here if I apply a voltage between drain and source? What is the current? Now look at this structure. What do you have in between drain and source? You have NPN, right? So what do you have? I hope you don't see an NPN transistor. You have two back-to-back -back parts, right? There is a P region in between, a diode here, and a diode here, right? So what happens if you have pi voltage between drain and source? You get basically zero current. Very, very, very small amounts of current because it's two back-to-back -back parts. So nothing interesting yet happens. Okay. Let me make my drawing a little bit simpler 
I'm going to do this thing. I'm going to connect the source to ground for now. And I'm going to connect the gate to a voltage source. I call it VGS. Right? Because it's between gate and source. Source is grounded, it's just VG. And I'll connect a voltage source to drain as well, and I'll call it VGS. Right? I'm going to play with these voltages and see what happens eventually. Okay, so let's keep VDS small. Let's say uh, VDS positive but approaching zero. So let's say VDS is zero plus a few millivolts. One, two, three, five millivolts. No, nothing that affects the operation of this device. And um, I know that inside the bulk of this material, what do I have? It's a P-type material. So I know that I have a whole bunch of holes that are my charge carriers in the bulk of the material. So let's say I apply a negative voltage to the gate. Minus one, minus two, some, some reasonable voltage. What happens to those holes? Holes. Holes are your positive charge carriers, right? They will be attracted to the surface. So you will have, let's say, you will have a bunch of holes here, right? Now, what will happen to this current? So let's just call this current ID. What do you think will happen to ID if I apply a, positive, a negative voltage? So VG negative. Well, and right now we're looking at VGS level. You know what? Uh, do you guys need this anymore? You have better pictures in the book. <laughs> so let's assume VGS is negative, right? A reasonable number, minus one volts, minus two volts. And VDS is small. Now in this case, what do you think is going to happen to ID? So ID was about zero before I applied the gate voltage or when the gate voltage was close to zero. Because I had two back-to-back dots. -back now, with some negative voltage at the gate, what do you think is going to happen to ID? I still have my two back-to-back -back dots. Right? Nothing has changed. So it's going to be my zero. What if I apply minus 3, minus 4, minus 5, minus 10 volts? All I'm doing is I'm increasing the density of volts here. It's as if I'm making this more and more like a P-type material, or, or like a P-plus type material. My diodes will not be able to conduct. So ID remains zero. That's not so exciting. How can I copy and pick out the Who's just press copy? Oh, well, like, well, it shows the usual one. Yeah. It hasn't pasted yet. How do I paste? Hold down. Uh, first copy and hold paper. Hold down. Uh, press paste. There you go. Okay, so this case wasn't that interesting. With a negative gate voltage, situation doesn't change. What if we push the gate voltage in the other direction? What if we apply a V gate that is positive? What will happen to the holes here? Well, so I have some random distribution of holes before. Now I apply a positive voltage to the gate. What happens to those holes? I'll push them away, right? So I'll start to push them away from the surface, but Still, I have two back-to-back dots. Right? Even though I still have two back-to-back dots. -back I still have a P region in between two M regions. Let's keep increasing the gate voltage. What will happen next? 
I push all the holes that are nearby away. What happens next? As I keep increasing the gate voltage. Well, what do you need for n time? You need more electrons than volts, yeah. right? So at some point, that is going to happen. Well, you remember, you have electrons here too. You have very, very, there is a very small number of them. If you keep increasing the gate voltage, you're going to bring those electrons closer and closer to the surface. You're going to attract the electrons to that surface. At some point, something magical happens. At some point, you're going to have a super narrow region here. I'm, I'm going to draw a thick region, but it's going to be super narrow. Right? Where you have more electrons than holes. Right above the surface. Because, you know, as soon as you go a little bit deep into the structure, that field you produce over there doesn't have the power to push the holes away or bring the electrons to the surface. Right? underneath that dielectric, you're going to have more electrons than holes. So over here, there is, at some point, more electrons than holes. Then what do you have? For ID, what do you think is going to happen to ID? It's going to flow. Yeah. Hmm? Just flow. Wow. It's going to go up. What do you have between the drain and source now? Short circuit. Not a short circuit, the resistor. Yeah. Right? Because it's not a perfect conductor. You have some electrons here that can transfer the charge for you. But it's not like a metal, it's not a perfect conductor, but you have some conductors. So instead of having two diodes, now you have an N plus region. This is what you have. An N plus region, an N region, and an N plus region. N plus here. N plus here, and N in between. But that's a resistor, right? So you can have conduction. Current can flow from here to here. Right? That's interesting. That's good. So if I plot, let's say, ID versus VDX, before that magic happened, before that VGS, was large enough to make the surface invert its doping type. And we call it inversion, because you, you have p-type dope, p-type material that is now inverted to n-type. Or it looks like n-type. You, you didn't really change the material. You just brought more electrons to the surface. Um, before that, nothing happens. But let's say the voltage that makes that thing happen, I call it threshold voltage. For VGS that is larger than your threshold voltage, you have a resistor between drain and source. So if you plot ID VDS curve, what do you see? Straight line. Right? So if I go and make VDS, let's say 1 millivolt, 2 millivolt, 5 millivolt, 10 millivolt, ID increases proportionally. Okay. Great. Yes. Well, shouldn't that only be the case after VDS is greater than the threshold? VDS is, is a small value. You know, it doesn't, have, doesn't oh, depend sorry, on the threshold. VGS. VGS has to be larger than the yeah, threshold. Yeah, for that graph. Yeah. So, so this is for, let's say, some VGS. So let's say VGS1, larger than V threshold. This will happen. If VGS1 is less than V threshold, you get zero current. Why doesn't this happen when you have a negative VGS and the graph is just the other way? Is it because the diodes are biased around it? No, because when you have a negative VGS, you don't have that end region between the drain and source. Right? So instead of having this channel, this is called channel. Oh no, so over here? You mean why doesn't it go become below zero? Yeah. That's okay. Your VGS can be negative, this behaves like a resistor. That's fine. The issue is that, okay, so this is fine. This you can stretch it like that. Like it's a resistor. The issue, and we'll see later on, that usually your drain, at least this is an NMOS, for an NMOS the drain voltage is higher than source. So it's usually, more, you know, VDS is usually positive. But if you want to plug it, yeah, it stretches to the negative values. Negative 10 millivolt will give you exactly the same amount of current that 10 millivolt does, but in the opposite direction, it's a resistor. 
Okay? But practically, usually, drain voltage for N MOSFETs is larger than the source voltage. So EDS is usually positive, and we focus on the positive values. Uh, this is why I can conduct if the voltage is negative, because then I, I imagine the electrons move away and then the holes are... No, 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 no. Electrons are controlled by the gate voltage, not the drain voltage. Oh, that's the drain I have two sources, right? So the gate voltage, once I set it and I create my channel, I, I do not touch it. I'm playing with VDS now, okay? Um, so, so I'm going to get rid of that talent, focusing on positive, but it is there, it is there. You know, just to make you happy. Oh, I had a different question. Oh, that was fine. I, I draw that much of it. Yeah. You have another question or something? You might answer it if you keep explaining. So okay, I'll so <clears throat> then hold on. So for BGS1 margin and the threshold voltage, uh, I get that behavior. What if I increase BGS1 now? So let's say I got that behavior. Let's say the threshold voltage is 1. I set BGS to 2, I got that behavior. Now let's say, what happens if I increase BGS yeah. to 3? Um, you make it less resistive. Or, yeah, just, uh, less resistive, more conductive. Yes. Yeah. So what will happen is that I will get something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So for this case, for BGS 2, that is larger than BGS 1. And both of them are larger than the pressure. Okay? So just one note. Remember we had a thermal voltage for BJTs? VT, 25 millivolt? I use VTH for threshold voltage. This is totally individual. Why? Anyway, this is a different thing. This is a different thing, VTH. The value of VTH depends on how you make this stuff, right? Because, for example, you can see. Actually, we'll see it soon. But how much dopants, how much electrons, how much holes you have here initially is going to affect VTH. What is the thickness of oxide is going to affect VTH? All those things will affect VTH, right? But it's totally independent, so to separate it from the thermal voltage, I put VTH. It's the subscript is TH instead of VT. VT is thermal voltage, we use it for size of VT. Okay. So, and then if you use some VGS3 that is smaller than VGS1, but still larger than. is larger than the threshold voltage, you get that kind of a behavior. Already you have a useful device. Already you have a variable resistor. A resistor whose value you control with the voltage. Right? First time you're saying that. But this is a linear resistor whose value you control with the voltage. Great. It's a potentiometer. It's, it's, so in a lot of circuits when you see a variable electronically controlled variable resistor, this is what it is. MOSFET. It's as simple as a MOSFET. It can, it can be. <laughs> it can be. Okay? All right, so that's great. So let's see. I'm getting some current through this guy. Let's see what are the parameters that can influence the amount of current I have. I'm getting some conduction. What do you think that ID will depend on? I'm going to look at a few parameters. I have to draw that top view again. So this is the top view. I had my N plus region here for source. My N plus region here for drain. And I'm just going to draw the dielectric side. And this is my gate area, right? So underneath the gate, underneath the dielectric, I created a channel. That's where the current flows from drain to source. The channel width is the same as the width of your doped region. So I'm going to call this the channel width, right? And the distance between these two dope regions is my channel length. So the channel that I have over there, the yellow, the yellow part under the gate, has a length and a width. And above the channel, I have a dielectric, a layer of a dielectric, 
and I assume the entire top surface of that dielectric is coated with the conductor. So tell me what affects, what parameters can affect that ID dependence on BDS. So I have ID versus BDS, right? Right now I assume I have applied the BGS that is larger than the threshold voltage. So I have established the channel. There is a channel. What parameters do you think is going to affect my, I don't even need this, my ID. So I'm going to say ID is proportional to what? Tell me a few parameters. What's the length? So if this length is longer, will I have more conduction, more current, or less current for the same? Less. 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 less current. So I, let's say I'm going to assume ID is proportional to one over length, right? What else? Sure. Width. Width increases. Width. It's is proportional to width, right? Because if I double the width, it's like I have two resistors in parallel. Double the current, right? So, proportional to width. What else? Oh, the voltage between sources. Yeah, so let's assume that's fixed. Yeah, that's that's true. So it, it should depend on BDS. Let's just try it again. What else? How much is doped? How much it is doped? No. Okay. Because it's indirectly proportional to that because VTH is, oh, okay. is a okay. function of how much doping you have. But once you have the channel, that's out of the picture. Temperature? But, but you know, let me write it this way. So ID should be proportional to VGS minus VTH, right? Because how much voltage, how much extra voltage I'm putting there to bring these electrons to the surface? If I put a lot of extra voltage, I have a lot of electrons. So lots of current will go through. If not, then I make it harder for my carriers, my charge carriers to, to go through. So it is proportional to VTS minus VTH. In a transistor, um, in an NPN transistor, one of the amps was more heavily built than the other. In this case of a source and drain, it's perfectly symmetric. Integrated MOSFETs are perfectly symmetric, source and drain, there's no difference between them. Discrete MOSFETs, there is a difference, we'll talk about them later. But let's focus on the question. What else is going to, if I set my voltages, 3 volts at the gate, 10 millivolts at the drain, source grounded, I have a channel, I want to see what is going to affect the magnitude of ID. Temperature? Yeah, for those, you know, I keep the temperature constant. Definitely. Yeah. Temperature is impacted, right? Because if I freeze this at zero Kelvin, there's no more white carriers. The current at the source? Hmm? The current at the source? No. No? ID and I source are actually going to be equal. Because all the current that goes uh, into the drain has to come out of the source. So another factor <coughs> is. If you look at this, two, well, you have a capacitor here, right? So you're bringing these electrons to the surface because of the field yeah. your voltage at the gate produces. That field is affected by the dielectric you have in between, right? What is that material? Because dielectric constant matters. And how thick it is? Because if you put a thick layer, you're going to have less field. Right? For the same voltage drop between the electrons. So it's going to be. A function of the dielectric constant, or let's say epsilon of the material, and a function of the oxide thickness, the T of oxide, the one over that, because the smaller the thickness, the higher the current, the stronger that BGS is going to be. One more thing, and we have the formula for it. How fast the electrons move in this semiconductor? The mobility of electrons. Right? How fast can they move between so this is the mobility of the 
The actual physics is a little bit more complicated, but this is the gist of it, right? So at the end of the story, you can show that IV, the formula, the physical formula, is mu n, mobility of your electrons, C oxide, the normalized capacitance of oxide. It's going to be uh, normalized by A. It's going to be the epsilon of your material divided by T oxide. That's C oxide. It's not a capacitance, it's normalized capacitance. Pair A, right? Pair A. Times W over L ratio, okay. right? Times VGS minus VTH times VGS. Just multiply everything on the right side. Right? So for a device, mobility of electrons. So it just says that if you apply this much field to this electron, how fast, physically, how fast it travels. No, no, that's the speed of light. Like, electrons move much, 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 much more slow. They are very slow. We're talking about centimeters per second or hundreds of centimeters per second. Wait, C O X is uh, E X over T O X. Yeah, right? C oxide. So this is the normal. C oxide should have been W times L, the area of your capacitor divided by the thickness of your capacitor times epsilon r, which includes the epsilon naught, or so relative to electric constant times this, right? So this is your actual capacitance. Okay. But it's normalized by the area. So it's just this divided by the oxygen. It's a technology parameter. If you choose to work with TSNC and this technology, you cannot play with any of these anymore. With uh, any of these anymore. W and L, you choose. C oxide, uh, you cannot choose, mu n, you cannot choose, but W and L are your choice, and VTH will be first. But that's the equation, as simple as that. Right? Okay, next. So far, a very easy device to understand. It's not complicated like NPN or TNT transistors. But those guys are much, much more complicated. But how come this wasn't invented first? If this is so much easier to understand. Well, but the concept. I mean, it has a NPN inside of it. So like, in order to make the MOSFET, you also have to make the... You go from diodes to MOSFETs, not diodes to BJD. Oh. Okay, that was a trick question. This was actually the idea. What the was conceived first. The idea for a MOSFET was conceived before NPN devices. NPN and PMP, actually, the invention or the discovery just happened by a little bit of chance. The guys who did it, they were really good physicists, but there was a little bit of chance in that. With this, there was another physicist in Germany that just came up with the entire structure and then, you know, showed that it should work. What was the problem? They couldn't make it. They couldn't make it, uh, and, it's not, it and it wasn't the top. So don't be happy. They couldn't make it because this device, as you see here, is extremely sensitive to the condition of what's going on at the interface between your silicon and the dielectric key. It's extremely sensitive to that condition. If you have any sort of dangling bumps here, any sort of contamination, any sort of charge traps, it's not going to work. So they tried to make it. It doesn't work. It, doesn't, it, it didn't work. It didn't work until late in the 50s and 60s when they figured out how to put down a layer of dielectric that doesn't create all sorts of problems later. Okay, so, so far we have a good resistor that is controllable, we like it. Let's see what happens if we start to put this in the So I'm going to draw this thing again.
So like before, I'm going to keep the source grounded. And I apply a very low voltage to drain because the source is grounded to VDS is the same as the V. And I apply some VGS to the gate. Okay? Let's assume I've established my channel. So I've gone and created a channel that stretches from drain to source. And it's the inversion thing has happened. And I have my variable resistor, so I have current going through this channel. Okay, so that's the, the yellow part is the inverted part. So far I'm assuming that what? VGS. Is larger than the threshold voltage by a good margin, right? If the threshold voltage is one, VGS is two. And VDS, I'm, I've been assuming it's really small. So I've been assuming that VDS is very small. And because of that, ID was given by the formula that I just showed you. Now, let's start increasing VDS. Right? So going from a few millivolts up. Going up, let's say, in 100 millivolt steps. Or 200 millivolt steps. What do you think is going to happen to that channel? It's going to be faster. So, right now, because I have a gate electrode across the entire channel, I have more or less the same depth for the channel, from the drain end to the source end. Right? It's, it's a uniform channel. Source is grounded. If I put a little bit of positive voltage on the drain, what do you think is going to happen? Let's say one volt. <coughs> or half a volt. Let's say the threshold voltage is one volt. Let's just use some numbers. Huh? Let's assume ETH is, let's say, one volt which is a reasonable number, and let's assume VGS is 2 volts, right, large enough to have the channel, and I'm increasing VGS from 0 to, you know, 0.5, 1, 2, 3, and we're going to go. So let's say at VGS close to 0, this is the situation. We already know that. What happens if VGS is half a volt or 1 volt? Yeah. Well, let's say half a volt. Let's start with half a volt. So if it is half a volt across this resistor, tell me this, what's the voltage at this end of this channel, at the very bottom end, the very source end, what is the voltage here? Zero. Zero. What's the voltage here? Zero. VDS, what is the voltage? What is the voltage in between, right in the middle of this? VDS over two, right? Something like this. Because it's a linear resistor, the voltage slowly drops across this to go from VDS to zero. Now you push VDS up, you make it half a volt. Then what do you think is going to happen to that channel? You it's still what? have VDS at that end and zero at this end. But look at what's happening at this corner. Your VGS was pushing the holes away. And VDS was very small. Now that you're increasing VDS, you're increasing the voltage here. You're actually negating some of that push by VGS. Right? So what's going to happen is that you're going to have a slightly narrower channel here. And as you increase VGS, it's going to be slightly narrower and narrower and narrower. Right? So instead of having a rectangular channel like that, you're going to have a little bit of a distorted channel that looks like this. Right? So you still have VDS at the right end, V0 volts at the left end, but the middle part is not necessarily VDS over 2, right? Because now you have a resistor whose dimension is changing. It's more conductive here than here. 
And as you increase VDS, at some point, what's going to happen is that the voltage here, V gate minus V drain, is going to be equal to VGH. It's going to become equal to your threshold voltage, right? The gate drain voltage. This is the voltage at the rightmost end of the channel. If VGD becomes equal to the threshold voltage, what happens after that? If you keep increasing the drain uh, voltage, so at at VGD equal to V threshold, what's going to happen? Your channel is going to vanish at the drain end. You don't have a channel anymore. Right? The holes are coming back. So you lose your continuous channel at the right end. Over time, before you get there, you know, your ID is still increasing with VDS, but it is increasing less and less and less. Right? And then the channel vanishes and the current cannot increase it. So if you look at ID VDS curve, this is what you're going to see. At the very beginning, you had your linear, linear happy resistor, right? Before VDS became comparable to the threshold voltage. As you get closer and closer to the threshold voltage at the gate drain end, your drain current, your channel is going to deform. It's going to become a triangular channel, cross section instead of a rectangular. Board. So ID will not increase as much. It's going to start to increase a little bit less. It's still increasing but it loses that linear relationship that it used to have with VDS. So initially linear, mm -hmm. then starts to become nonlinear like that, right? And then at some voltage, then VGD is equal to VTH. You lose your channel at the drain end. And this current will not depend on VDS anymore. It becomes constant. Why does it become constant? Because when the channel vanishes over there, you're back to your reverse biased diode. Now this is somewhat resembling NPN or PMP transistors. You know, you have a reverse biased diode. If you let it be on its own, it doesn't want to conduct any current. But if you bring a lot of charge carriers near the depletion region, it lets them through. So that's how you get your constant current. Now this current does not depend on EDS anymore. What do I have here? The current source. Right? That's beautiful. With one device, I can have a linear resistor, a non-linear resistor, or a current source. That's beautiful. And we already know a current source is a very useful thing. And you already know this is a voltage-dependent current source. Because playing with VGS, you get a different current. Right? So this is for one VGS. And then if you have a second VGS that is, let's say, smaller, you still get your linear at the beginning, you still get your non-linearities, and then it saturates at the smaller point. And then you can have larger values as well. So, you have a controlled current source. This is a device that we really, really like. You already know one, right? You can play with it the way we did with NPN. Nice thing about it is that it's a voltage controlled current source. For an NPN, it was more or less a current controlled current source. It was IB that would set IP, IC. Now it's a voltage that is setting your uh, current, your IB. That's nice. Let's look at the formula. This part, let's look at that. 
ID for that region is found from this expression. So I'm gonna write the equation. It's not as easy to see. It's not too hard. So I'll, I'll tell you what it looks like then. I'll tell you how to draw it. This part we saw before. This is the linear part, right? This we saw before. <clears throat> so this is the linear part, right? This is my linear resistor. That's what we saw before, the, the equation of this is the resistor. But the nonlinearity kicks in. And you can show that it follows a pattern like that. Okay. It's proportional to VDS squared. Where does that come from? It's from the shape of the channel that is taking the triangular cross section. And when you calculate the resistance from drain to source to calculate the drain and all of that, you need to integrate from drain to source for the resistance, right? And you're integrating a linear shape, you get a squared factor. That's, that's where the squared factor comes from. Check the book. I think he drives the whole thing in like two pages. It has a much, much, much easier, easier physics than an NPA device. But this is it. So for the device that is operating before, so this is for when? For VGB less than V threshold, right? I haven't, I, I still have a channel at the drain. This is my resistor. Initially a linear resistor, then becomes a non-linear resistor. But I still have my channel. At the point that VGB becomes equal to VTH, the channel disappears, the equation will change a little bit. I'll show you that in a second. But this is the equation, right? Not too hard. And then remember, mu and C oxide is a constant that you will have, like beta for your transistor. W and L depends on what you're using. If you're using a discrete MOSFET, it's a given value. You cannot change it. If you're designing an integrated MOSFET, or integrated circuit. L has a minimum, that's the technology. So CMOS, seven nanometer CMOS, what does it mean? Seven nanometers. It means L is seven nanometers, minimum L. Okay. 22 nanometer CMOS, 45 nanometer CMOS. That's L, that's the indicator of you know, how advanced your lithography is. W is usually your choice. You choose W to suit your need for that circuit. How many like, three variables like that are, are here. Like if you didn't know like half of these and you want to like design a W and L. Hmm? W and L. Only? Only W and L. Oh my yeah. That's, that's good because for a VJT you have none. <laughs> you, you, you get so what you get and you, you cannot change anything about a VJT. For MOSFET you have two parameters to to play with. What is the range for W over L? It can be less than one, very rarely it's less than one, up to a few thousand. What? Depending on how you design it, right? If you look at digital MOSFETs, it's close to one to one, because they're pushing for the minimum dimension. They choose minimum L, and usually the smallest W they can get away with. For analog performance, you want, what do you want from a G transistor for amplification? Remember from NPN. What do you want? A high what? Well, where does the high gain come from? Transistor property, high GM. You want high transconductance, right? We'll see. For a MOSFET, transconductance is directly proportional to W over L. So for analog designers, you go and choose W to get the GM that you want. L is usually not the minimum when you design with analog circuits because minimum size device usually has a crappy performance. Digital guys don't care. Analog guys are more picky. Okay. Any questions? We have 10 minutes to go, I want to finish this. Okay. So, this equation holds for as long as VGB is less than VTH. It's positive, now I have some voltage going, some current going through the device, but I still have a channel. When for VGE, and actually you know that this is definitely true, that VGS has to be larger than VTH. 
right? Because I want to have the channel to begin with. Without the channel, I have nothing, no current. So this has to be satisfied, and this is also satisfied. Now, for VGD, that is larger than VTH, then my channel vanishes as soon as VGD becomes to equal to VTH. I will have the same current that I had here when VGD became equal to VTH. This doesn't have anything with VGD in it. Let's just see if we can make that happen. Um, right? So whatever current you had at the edge will stay like that. So let's see what is that current. So at VGD equal VTH. What can I say? I can write this. I don't have anything that says VGD over there, but I have VGS and VDS. So let's write this as VGS and VDS. So I, what I can see is that VGD is what? VGS minus VDS, right? Or VG minus VD. Doesn't matter. I add and subtract the VS as well. So VGD is VGS minus VDS. So that is equal to VTH. Or from here I can see that VDS is equal to VTS minus VTH. Because I want to get rid of VDS, I go and plug this into that equation. And then you get this equation for the current. Why? Because you know, VGS of VDS is equal to VGS minus VTH. So that's VGS minus VTH squared minus VGS minus VTH is squared. I have two of them here, so the whole thing reduces to VGS minus VTH squared. So that current oh, no, no. is this current, right? The current after I pass that region. And that's it. Those are all the equations we need to know for MOSFETs. ID is given by this expression when you're past that, uh, when the channel is pinched off, that's the term they use. That when the channel vanishes, then they say it's pinched off. Before that, you have that relationship between ID and VDS. If VDS is really small, then you can ignore the VDS square term over there and you have the linear resistance. So, based on what you have for VGS and VDS, you will have three operating regions. If, how do I want to do that? How did I do that before? So you have three possibilities. First one, when I didn't have a channel and I didn't have anything interesting. I call it color. This is where. This is where my VGS was less than VTH. Right? So I didn't have a channel at the source end. And VGD was also less than VTH. And I don't have a channel at the drain. So both ends, I don't have enough voltage to create a channel. In a case like that, I have two, um, uh, two off diodes and IB which is the same as IS. IS in this case is the source current, it's not saturation current, okay? IS is the current of source terminal. IB and IS in a MOSFET are always equal. Why? Because it's one. Why IB and IS are always equal? This is the one we have. It's, 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 
What about IG? What's that about that? IG is always zero. Yeah. Okay? If you look at the KCL here, if I cut this, the current that goes in should be the current that comes out. IG is zero, ID is um, going in, IS that comes out must be equal to. Right? So in a MOSFET, IG is always zero. Life is easy. It's not like the base current that you don't know if you should ignore it or not. You have to watch for all the other currents around. IG is zero. Life is easy. Okay? And ID is always equal to IS. It's not a fraction of it. It's exactly whatever you have. Here is going to be what you get at that. So this is source code. Okay. So the simplest of all cases, like always, is cutoff. No current, open circuit, life is easy. When you have a resistor, you have established a channel, but this channel is its width is, is dependent on your gate source voltage, and you have a channel that extends from the drain to source. We call this the trial region. This is where your MOSFET behaves like a variable resistor. It may be a linear variable resistor if VDS is small, or you may have some nonlinear. So what are the conditions that establish a trial and put the device in trial region? You must have channel at the source end, and you must have channel at the drain end, right? So you have a channel that stretches from end to end. Okay? This is trial. You have a resistor, a variable resistor. A voltage controlled resistor. Equation for current. That's the equation for current. Okay, if VDX is small, what is small in this case? So with VJTs, remember we said, you know, if VBE is small, if your input signal is small, and then what was our um, yardstick? Say, say that. Thermal voltage. So thermal voltage was our yardstick, right? We said if the changes across the base emitter voltage are small compared to BP, then life is nice and beautiful. So in this case, when I say if BDS is small, what do I, what am I comparing it with? What I want to do is that I want to ignore this higher order channel. What do I compare it to? compared to VGS minus VDH, right? So that's, that's your yardstick. It's not a constant like the thermal voltage because this can be one volt, this can be 10 volts, this can be zero, right? Well, not zero, but point volts, right? So if VDS is much smaller than VGS minus VDH, if that's the case, then I can ignore this term. Or you're at the beginning of that curve. You're in that linear region, right? And, and you can approximate ID. With this expression. Okay? So that's that. And then we have the third region. Which has an unfortunate name. Who, who knows the name of the region where the current stays constant and doesn't respond to VDS? We chose a bad name. 
Active is a good name I use. Oh. The name that you see in textbooks and papers and literature is saturation right? So this is called saturation. It is called saturation because your current has saturated and it's not going any further. Very different from saturation in BJTs. Saturation in BJTs was a useless region. Here, this is my desired region. I call it, it's saturation. So if you look at your textbook, any textbook, it is called saturation, right? I call it active. Just to avoid that confusion with saturation with BJTs. But, almost universally, it is called the saturation region, right? So this is where I have lost the channel at the drain end, but still have a channel at the source end. What are the conditions? To have the channel at the source end, I need to have a V threshold, sorry, VGS that is larger than V threshold, but at the drain end, I don't have it anymore. And uh, the equation for the current is one half un c ox w over l vgs minus vth squared. Okay? And then if you want to plot it in the active region, IV VGS, it's going to look like this. For VGS all the way to VTH, you have nothing. Right? Then you have this quadratic relationship between ID and VGS. For a constant VGS, let's say one more, two more. So that's your ID VGS curve. That is your ID VGS curve. We have a new device. Based on what I just told you and you listened to, you should be able to solve MOSFET circuits at DC. We'll do a few examples. But this is the basic. Yeah. But just one note, I, I think I want to close this. It's much, much easier than VJTs with MOSFETs. Tell me why. Let, I'll, I'll, you know, I have three minutes. Stop asking questions. You must go home. <laughs> Oh, I'm going to show you the symbol. That's the symbol. The symbol for a MOSFET is this. You have different types of FETs. MOSFET is one of them. So they actually separate the gate from the channel that is between the drain and source. There is actually a physical separation between them. It's an N type MOSFET. You're going to have a similar device or a similar discussion if you switch the substrate type from P to N and you know, dope these two regions P plus and apply negative gate source voltage and all the other stuff, same thing happens, right? Exactly the same. But this is the symbol for the device. You have a drain terminal, a source terminal, and a gate terminal. In digital circuits, they actually don't even mark which terminal is going to terminal and source because the device is perfectly symmetric. In analog electronics, we care. So we put a little bit of a marker, a, a little arrow on the source terminal to make our lives easier. And that's the symbol. Okay. And now, if I ask you to go and find, let's say, ID here or, or um, anything else, now with the equations we have, we can go and solve, right? So if I tell you that I have one volt here at the gate, the threshold voltage is on uh, 0.75, you can go and figure out what the current should be. We'll do it next lecture. Uh, but uh, this is it. So why is it easier? My, let me go back to my question. Why are MOSFET circuits easier to analyze than BJT circuits? Because uh, the current circuit is nicer to work with. That would be my first point. Like you have zero current. Because. Your gate draws zero current. For whatever that is before this guy, it looks like an open circuit. It doesn't bother you. It doesn't bother whatever. It, it doesn't load the circuits that go before it. Right? So it makes your analysis much, much easier. Uh, what else? The current voltage. Yeah. Are this like one or two formulas? Well, that's true. 
But also, the formulas are easier to use, right? It's a quadratic relationship. You solve it, and you get an exact value for IP or BGS, whichever you want. For BJT, you have to go through iterations, multiple iterations until you close to the right answer. In a MOSFET quadratic equation, you solve, you get two answers. One of them is not acceptable. You'll see how to reject it, right? But that's easy. The other reason things are easier is because now you've gone through the hard part. You've done the BJTs. You're going to appreciate these a lot more. It's just easy. You just fly through. Uh, okay. Any questions? Okay. So on Tuesday, we look at MOSFETs at DC. We'll solve a bunch of circuits with MOSFETs at DC. And we get into small signal operation. And if you want, we'll talk about P MOSFETs as well. But it's the same thing, the same story. The threshold voltage is negative for P MOSFETs, but all the equations and everything else is the same. So maybe we'll touch that. So we'll do the DC analysis, small signal analysis, and P MOSFETs. No, it's an error. I think it's 40 years. Is that 20? 20? It's an, it's an error. No, it's an error. 20? It's an error. So it's an error. Uh, it's an error. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was saying, I was like, I think ain't no All right, so for the tutorial, if you have questions, we'll go through your questions. If you don't have questions, I have a bunch of example problems at the end of the BJT amplifier section, and then I'll solve a few of those. Okay. Oh, fuck. Or we can talk about the assignment, because I think the solution is possible by now. We have a quiz next Friday on BJT amplifiers. Can you give some examples of BJT amplifiers? Yeah, so if, if there are no other questions, we'll just go through a bunch of those. Mm -hmm. okay. So I have a couple of favorites. Let me show you one, and if you know how to do it, go home.
let's just call it RIB, was 1 over GN plus RB over beta plus 1. Right? All right, you can solve. Okay, so. If you want, we go to a, uh, I'll look at one of these that is a bit more interesting. So, so I want to find the Rx. I see that I have an emitter and then some other stuff behind it. So I don't have a single resistor in base, but if I find the equivalent resistor to the left, I can replace whatever it is with the resistor. So what is it going to be? It's going to be 1 over GM1 plus RB divided by beta plus 1. That's the REQ you see here, right? Yeah. And this is beta 1 plus 1 if the two transistors are not the same. So that's REQ, but then I have only a resistor in the base. So Rx is going to be 1 over GM2. And remember, GM1 and GM2 are probably, but in this case, they're definitely different because you have two very different currents or ICs. Right? So they are different. Plus REQ that I found in the bar divided by beta 2 plus 1. Okay? And that's it. Or you can draw the small signal analysis and do the thing. Okay. Uh, maybe we do it for a more interesting problem. Let's see. Um, this one. So what happens when I look at this? Um, AC operation, small signal operation. C1 will be a short circuit, right? If C1 is a short circuit, right now, it doesn't look like I can use the formulas for this circuit because the collector and base are connected. But then C1 becomes grounded, this circuit will become this. So AC circuit, the equivalent AC circuit is going to be this. Your AC source stays in. Uh, R1 is between that base and C1, which is now shorted to ground. So this is R1. And then I have my transistor. RE and then the collector I have RC to ground and R2 was from the collector to C1 but that is also And now I look at this, this is my basic common emitter stage. I have the gain for this. This is GMRC over 1 plus GMRE with the negative sign. And uh, so I know the gain from here to here. I need to find this voltage. To find this voltage, I say, what is the resistance that I see when I look into the base of this device? It's R5 plus beta RE, or beta plus 1 RE. That's the resistance hanging here in parallel with R1. That's one equivalent resistance. I find the voltage division. Okay? Let's find something more interesting. <coughs> this one, same issue, same thing, right? So again, you're biasing it with the current source, whatever you have current. Uh, the DC analysis for this one is a little bit tricky. AC analysis, this, actually DC analysis for this one, huh? <laughs> this one will be off if you do the DC analysis. So biasing is not shown. This is because you don't have between base and emitter, you don't have enough voltage. Anyhow, uh, assuming things are all right, AC circuit you have C2 grounded. I want for AC circuit it's a DC source. It will be an open circuit. This is with your short circuit to ground, and you are again back to the basic common emitter stage, right? R2 from emitter to ground, RC between the correct on ground, and then the rest of it as before. <laughs> this circuit I like. It's good. And I'll come back to that later. We'll do the full small signal analysis for this. This is a useful circuit. That's why I want to do the full small signal analysis. Uh, 
This one again looks tricky at the beginning because, okay, it looks like a common base stage because you're applying the signal to the meter taking the output from the collector. But base and collector look like they're connected, right? But when you look at the AC circuit, capacitors are shorted, base will be shorted, so R2 will be out of the circuit, and R1 will lose its connection to the base. So in the collector circuit, you will have RC in parallel with R1, and base is grounded, and that's your common base, the core common base stage, right? So we solve the this. This one we already did. This here done. So this is the type of the circuit you see a lot in IC design because there is a difference. When you design circuits for integrated circuits or discrete circuits, there are different approaches. Discrete circuit design, you use as many resistors and capacitors as you like. And usually as few transistors as you can. Because of the cost and performance issue. Integrated circuits is the opposite. You use as many transistors as you need. And the fewest number of resistors and capacitors. And the reason for that is that resistors and capacitors, when they make them on integrated circuits, are much, much, much bigger than the transistors. And the cost is based on area. So a single resistor is going to cost you as much as 100 transistors. So if you can do the job with 20 transistors instead of a single resistor, you do it. Okay? And so, so situations like this, you, know, you see a whole bunch of transistors on top of each other or next to each other. These are usually coming from IC design. But let's see how we solve it. So if I want to find the input resistance, it's Ri plus beta Re. What is Re? It is this guy plus whatever I see at the bottom. What do I see at the bottom? It's 1 over GM2 plus RB1 divided by beta 2 plus 1, right? That's the resistor I see in the meter. That's in series with this. Multiply that by beta 1, and it shows at the base. What do I see at the, yeah, same thing. <laughs> so, any questions or should we solve that interesting circuit I mentioned? Which You can take the output from here, this is called a zero one or this. Usually take it differentially from between the O2 and the O1. Yeah. So if the output is VO2 minus V. Well we'll see how it is. Okay. So this is I fundamental amplifier stage. It's called the differential pair. Okay. Uses two transistors. And uh, let's see how it works. So let me do it the easy way first. Let, let's see, my goal is to find AV. That is the O1 or AV. Right? And R in. That is the resistance that I'm looking to the base of Q1. Okay, so I'm showing you the biasing and everything, right? But if the devices are biased properly, so usually what you have is two transistors that are exactly the same as each other. They're called a matched pair, right? So you can actually go to DigiQ or Mauser or those websites and buy a pair of matched BJTs, NPN or BJT. They're matched pairs that come into one package. They may give you access to all six terminals of these devices 
But for the vast majority of the cases, the emitters are actually connected internally, and you have access to the other four. So you have access to the emitter plus the other four. Okay? So it's a matched pair. You can buy them, and then if you buy one of these matched pairs, the two transistors are exactly the same. So if, or a very, very, very close to each other. The differences are less than, let's say, 0.01% between them. So if that's the case, and assuming that your gain has no DC bias, what do you think is going to be IC1 and IC2 in this set? Zero. Well, I bias is some kind, uh, and assume VCC is large enough so the devices are inactive in each other. What is IC1 and IC2? And usually for symmetry, you use the same values for RC. So I'm going to say RC1 and RC2 are equal, right? Usually that's the case. They don't have to be. But usually they are. It's going to split equally between the two, right? Because the bases are ground, the meters are connected to the same node. And therefore, I bias is going to split equally between this junction and this junction, and therefore your ICs are going to be equal. So that's nice. If that's the case, and RC1 and RC2 are equal, then BO1 and BO2 will be equal to, right? Because BO1, let's say DC. Right? So half the current goes through IC1, half the current becomes IC2. And BO1 is VCC minus ICRC on the left side, VCC minus ICRC on the right side, the two are equal. So if you look at the difference between the two, the difference is zero. Right? So zero at the input, the difference between those two voltages at the output is zero as well. So that's it. So DC analysis is easy. What about AC? So if I want to analyze this second under AC conditions, what do I have? In this case, actually, AC circuit is so much easier than small signal without Google. Circuit, your DC current source goes away. That's what you got. Okay? Great. Now I'm going to ask you what is VO1 or what is the gain from V into VO1 or from V into VO2? Okay? What is the gain? So let's look at the gain from V into VO1. If I'm looking at V into VO1, I can just replace Q2 when everything that is on the right side with this equivalent resistance, right? So what is the equivalent resistance when I look into the emitter of Q2, when I look to the right of this node? What is it? You just saw that. 1 over GM plus RB over beta plus 1, right? There's no RB, so it's just 1 over GM2. So, whatever that I had there, I'm going to replace it with 1 over GM2. Uh, this is my common emitter stage. I know the gain, I know everything. So, I know the gain of this guy is minus GMRC, uh, in this case GM1 and RC1, over 1 plus GMRE, so it's GM1 RE, RE is 1 over GM2, right? 
But good news, these are two BJTs that are matched and biased at the same current. So GM1 and GM2 can be equal. And ICO will be taken to translate that. So my gain is minus one half GM1 or GM2 RC. Okay, so it's half the gain of the common meter stage. The common meter stage with zero meter resistance would have a gain of GMRC. Now this is half GMRC. Okay, so I, 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 it's not too bad, but I could do better. See the common meter. Then why would I like this thing? Let's find the gain from VN to VO2. Okay, if you want to do that analysis. And let me redraw that circuit again. And this is the AC circuit, right? So no VCC at the top. I, I, I'm gonna, should we do a small signal first or do you wanna use the formulas? Who is brave enough to use formulas? Bunch of cards. <laughs> Come on. Check. But, but, okay, so tell me. Uh, let, let's do the small signal and then I'll show you the AC. Okay, looks complicated, doesn't look like anything I've seen before, so I draw my small signal. This is my small signal circuit, right? I got rid of the DC sources at the top of RC1 and RC2, and the DC current source at the bottom becomes an open circuit. This is my uh, small signal circuit. How do I solve this? The current they, going between yeah, them? Yeah. Why should it be zero? Because look at your source. Uh, You're connecting this end of a resistive network to a higher voltage than that end. There probably is something. Maybe, maybe not, but there is probably okay. something. Why well, never? I was working this assumption with no current to that point. Because then you, there's no voltage drop, right? So then, then the two are isolated, then oh, well, your second it's stage doesn't see anything and VO2 is zero. Uh, it's not zero. Maybe I'm thinking of this wrong, but wouldn't it be if you have small input voltage that it would then um, create some current and therefore some voltage at the base at the negative end of V R of V pi two, which would then mean the current would go. Then worry about the directions then, right? But how do I solve? So where do I start for solve? Is the voltage drop across R C two and R C one the same? So you could just start with using the same like depend sources there to ground. Uh. <laughs> I don't know what you are saying, oh, but I don't know. 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 I don
Let me do one other thing. What, what storm is driving the KCL here? And I have four branches. Let's add up those currents. They should add up to zero, right? Let's call that the X. So, this current plus this current plus this current plus this current should add up to zero. Or, I can say, those two currents should be equal to those two currents that are leaving the node should equal the two currents from the collector that are coming and entering the node, right? So GM1 be pi 1 plus GM2 be pi 2. These are the two currents that are entering the node. Should be equal to the two currents that are leaving the node. So, uh, this current is Vx minus V in divided by R pi 1. Well, I have some quick solution right away. Let me write those two currents as V pi 1 and R pi 1. So v pi 1 over R pi 1 and V pi 2 over R pi 2. Right? So this current is going to be minus V pi 1 over R pi 1. And that current is minus V pi 2 over R pi 2. Okay? Next. Actually, I never solved it like this in 15 minutes. V pi 1 times GM1 plus 1 over R pi 1 plus V pi 2 over GM2 plus 1 over R pi 2 is here. Right? I know that the devices are biased the same and I know their failures are the same. So this and this are the same numbers. V pi 2 is minus V pi 1. What do you have for V pi 1? V pi 2 is the opposite. Good, but it doesn't help me. Because both of them are unknown. I need one more equation. Right? So help me with the other equation. That is going to be V in is equal to going down V by 1, going up minus V by 2. V by 1 minus V by 2. V by 2 is minus V by 1, so I can find V by 1 right away. So I can see that from here right away that if I put for minus V by 2, if I put V by 1, V by 1 is half V in. And V by 2 is minus half V in. Okay. Actually, now that we have solved it this part, I can easily find both V02 and V01. Right? V01 is going to be. In that circuit, look at this circuit. So this is V01. V01 is the current times that resistor. So GM1 V51 times RC1. Right? The current times the resistance with a negative sign. 
because I'm drawing the current and the current is going up the resistor. So V01 is minus Tm1, V by 1, Rc1, and V02 is the same thing. Minus Gm2, V by 2, Rc2. This is V by 1 is half A in. Positive gain from one branch, negative gain from the other branch. Right? So, minus half GMRC1, we actually saw that before. We said this is a half a, and it has a common in this stage. Right? But it's, it's interesting. In this stage, when I apply a being to the input, I have a negative gain from here and a positive gain from here, and they're exactly the same. So if you apply something like this here, you get something like this over here, and then something like this over here. You get the two versions, the signal and the inverter. Both of them are magnified by a factor of 1 over GMRC. Uh, half of GMRC, sorry. But you get the inverted one from this branch, and a magnified one positive gain from the other branch. Usually, you look at the difference between the two, VO2 and VO1. So if you look at the difference, you get your GMRC gain back. Right? And you get rid of the DC that you have. You don't need a capacitor to get rid of that DC anymore. You don't need that coupling capacitor. The voltage difference between them has no DC. Same thing. When we read through as a small signal model, why do we just because it's a DC current source. Right? But this is beautiful. I have my positive gain, I have my negative gain, I have all of the gain that I had from a single common emitter stage back. And if I don't like the DC value, if I'm fitting this into an A2D, you know, when you look at your A2Ds, there are A2Ds that have differential inputs. What does that mean? Has, has anybody seen, used the A2D before? I don't know if so. So A to Ds can measure, can digitize a voltage relative to ground or a differential voltage, so V1 minus V2. And that's the preferred method, especially for precision A to Ds, right? So it produces your output for a precision A to D. You can put it right before the A to D, magnify your signal, and you've got done. And you don't have to have those coupling capacitors and any of that. It's DC free, just the way it is. No, you can amplify DC signal with this. Okay? So, it's a great stage. And it's, it's used in a lot, it has a ton of applications. What you can do is that you can take the out gain from here and put it here. And you see it's the same, it does the same thing, but it's only the gains are different. Now this gain is positive, this gain is negative. Right? But what does that mean? If you have V1 here and V2 here, okay? This output is proportional to V2 minus V1. It does the subtraction for you as well. And gives you some gain, right? It does a lot more. So it, this is all the linear stuff, and this is a fraction of the linear stuff it does. It actually can do multiplication too, but I don't have it like that. <laughs> anyway, it's a great stage. Small signal wasn't too bad. You just have to be careful about you know how you uh, want to do your case scales and anything else. But we just did it in like two lines, three lines. Can you derive? I can tell like the steps like seem pretty simple, but like what? How do you know where to look for the like So if you have a node where a lot of currents are going into it, or a lot of it, try the case scale. That, that's usually a good point. And KVLs, I want to have the minimum number of elements in my KVLs. Because the, the issue with KVL is, you know, at the end of the story, in many cases, I want to know voltages. 
What gives you voltages is the KCM. So KCM is probably my go-to method in most situations. KVLs, we can go through loops, but the issue with that is that every voltage can, every component can have a different current rate, right? And then it can become a little bit confusing. I, I like KCL, and in this case, I have a node with four contacts. Turns out that they are related to each other, so it became easy. But that's my go-to method most of the time. Unless you have a, let's say, voltage source at that node that draws or supplies any current you want, and you're not interested in that current. So it becomes a new variable that you cannot really figure out. So unless you have that, uh, I go with the case here in most situations. Okay. All right, so let's do the, the other thing. Uh, three minutes, two minutes. The AC circuit thing, right? So how do I, the, the first part was easy, you know, from VO1 to V in was easy. I have a common emitter with a emitter degeneration with an R in. That was easy. But what was from V in to V O two? What do I have? Two two one go. So follow the same one. What do I have? What do I have? What is this first guy? Signal goes into the base, comes out of the emitter. What is it? No, but what kind of a stage is it? Signal goes into the base, comes out of the emitter. Common. The other one. Common collector. And the base emitter, the other one. Common collector. So this is the common collector stage from here to here. So if that's the case, V X over V in, the gain of a common collector stage is what? GMRE over 1 plus GMRE. What is GM? What is RE? GM is the GM of the first transistor Q1, Q2. What is RE? RE is the resistance that I see here, right? So what is it? GM1, RE is our equivalent, is 1 over GM2, right? So if GM1 times 1 over GM2 divided by 1 plus GM1 times 1 over GM2. So GM1 and GM2 are equal, so that's 1 over 2. That's a bad common collector stage, right? Because we said the gain is just for the point nine or something. That's okay. Now, now we found out the signal here. What if we follow the signal? It goes into the emitter, comes out of the collector. So what do I have here? Signal goes into the emitter, comes out of the collector. It is common base. Common the other. Right? Emitter, collector, common base. So for common base, so what I want to do is that I want to find V over Vx. For common base, the gain is GMRC. Right? Positive, like the common emitter, but with a positive gain. Quick. So GMRC, GM2, RC2, that's it. So the total gain okay. so That's our positive gain That's the branch with positive gain right? 
So with AC circuits, I could solve it as well. But you have to isolate your stages, make sure that you know, each one is which, use the right formula as well. This is a differential curve. You remember this thing. This is a really, really nice circuit. Any questions? Sorry? I'll see you on Tuesday.